You may have seen a story in the media recently about the holy man, a priest at a shrine in southern Sri Lanka, who was arrested for the sexual abuse of several children. There was also another story in the media at about the same time about the arrest of a school principal who had done pretty much the same thing. These incidents arouse the usual public outrage, but as we all know, such outrage rarely lasts more than a day or two, a news cycle. I myself feel sad for the victims, in part because of the abuse they suffered, but perhaps in greater part because of the stigmatization that will follow them for the rest of their lives as a result of their being publicly exposed, publicly identified as victims of sexual abuse. It also made me recall the fact that the medical and social sciences literature shows that such abuse is much more widespread than we might think. It isn't restricted to a handful of foreign pedophiles, errant clergymen, perverted school principals. So in this video, I'm going to review the scientific literature on the sexual habits of young people in Sri Lanka, and then some related stuff. Most of what we know about sex is derived from our personal experience. We know little about the sexual behavior of others. In Sri Lanka, sex is not generally discussed even amongst close friends. Even parents rarely discuss sex with their children. 40% of girls say they wouldn't talk to a parent if they had a sexual problem. 88% of boys say the same. The internet, of course, provides a great deal of information about sex, but there's also a lot of misinformation. One such piece of misinformation is that Sri Lanka tops the list in Google searches for the word sex. However, this doesn't mean that Sri Lankans have a disproportionate interest in sex. As Nuan Senaratna clarifies in this excellent explanation, this is more likely to be because Sri Lankans use the word sex when searching for pornography on the internet. English-speaking countries, of course, would use search terms like porn rather than sex. So we can dispel that myth at the very outset. I often ask friends whether their children have had the HPV vaccine, the human papilloma virus vaccine. I ask them this because it indicates whether they've been able to broach the subject of sexual behavior with their 11 year olds. Almost nobody has. HPV is a sexually transmitted virus. Every child, especially girl children, should receive this vaccine before the age of 11 or so. Many women who are infected by the virus develop cervical cancer later in life. This is the second most important cancer, the second most common cancer among women in Sri Lanka. Around 1,500 new cases are diagnosed every year. And men too are at risk from HPV. They can develop cancers of the mouth or the larynx, or less commonly, the penis or the anus. The HPV vaccine dramatically reduces the risk of cancer in both women and men. If you have children aged 11 or more, especially girl children who haven't been vaccinated, you might want to talk to your doctor about this. The scientific literature shows that there's a huge diversity of sexual behaviors in our society. Some of you will be surprised to discover what's going on around you. Others who worry about their sexuality or past sexual experiences might be relieved to discover that you are not alone. Anyway, let's get down to it and see what the scientific surveys, the surveys done by scientists and doctors and sociologists, tell us about the sexual behaviors of young people in Sri Lanka. A good place to start is perhaps the survey conducted by Dr. Bilesha Pereira of the University of Rohana and Dr. Michael Rees of Indiana University. They surveyed 3,134 students aged 18 to 20, so people about the time they leave school for university, in six districts across Sri Lanka. See what they found. Almost a third of girls and more than a half of the boys said they were sexually active already 
by the age of 20. One in every five boys and 3% of the girls had engaged in penetrative vaginal or anal intercourse. Around one in every 10 of these young people had had oral sex with an opposite sex partner. That said, while 13% of the boys said they had had penis-vagina intercourse, only 3% of girls admitted to having done so. You can do the math. About one in every five boys had had intercrural or between the thighs sex, whether with a girl or with another boy, although only 4% of girls said they had experienced this. To me, two findings of this study provide special causes for concern. The first is that about one in every 10 girls and one in every five boys say they have been forced to engage in sex against their will. This is a shocking statistic that I'm sure will worry many parents. Second, among those who had engaged in penis vagina sex, only a quarter of all boys and one in every 10 girls said they had ever used a condom. The risk of pregnancy from this neglect is obvious. Sri Lanka's extremely high rate of abortion, remember all abortions are illegal in this country, suggests that unexpected pregnancies are common enough. But in the absence of condoms, the risk of contracting sexually transmitted infections is also very high. Homosexual sex between boys was also common. An interesting finding was that about one in every 10 of these 18 to 20 year old boys said they were in a homosexual relationship with another male. More than twice as many boys said they had had intercrural or between the thighs sex with another boy, obviously casually. A slightly smaller number had engaged in anal sex, with about 13% having engaged in oral sex. So, as you can see, even school children are not only sexually active, but sexually adventurous. Part of the reason I'm producing this video is to reassure them that they are normal, assuming that is, that there is such a thing as normal when it comes to sex. But the reality in some parts of Sri Lanka might surprise you. Dr. Niroshan Jayasekara at the University of Sydney surveyed the sexual habits of 400 plantation workers in the age group 18 to 24 years around Kotagala in the central province. He found that the average age at which boys had their sexual debut was just 13 and a half years. In the case of girls, sexual debut was at 18 and a half years. Remember, these are averages. So many of these girls and boys were introduced to sex when they were much younger. Perhaps most tragically, 5% of the girls said their sexual debut had occurred before their 10th birthday. In this sample of people, 86% of men reported having had homosexual sex. 35% of them had had two to five sexual partners by the age of 24. Almost a third of them had had more than five. So people are not just sexually active, but also sexually promiscuous. Now let's consider a particularly unpleasant aspect of sex in Sri Lanka. Doctors Bilesha Pereira and Truls Isby of Duke University surveyed 2,389 students, again aged about 18 years, but this time in southern Sri Lanka. They found that 14% of these youngsters had suffered sexual abuse as children. Among children not residing with their parents, more than 20% were victims of abuse. You shouldn't allow yourselves to think that these problems are limited to the poor. This study showed that the children of rich families were at 50% higher risk of abuse than children from poor families. Also, maths and science stream students were at almost twice the risk of those studying the arts. Almost one in every five maths and science stream students had suffered sexual abuse as a child. These findings have been supported by many other studies. For example, Abe Vodana and colleagues found among 242 schoolboys they interviewed in Colombo district, 
that more than one in every five had experienced sexual abuse. These figures are also broadly consistent with those reported by Professor Harendra de Silva over the past quarter century. He pioneered the study of child abuse in Sri Lanka and continues to lead the field uh, to this day. So in the course of the past quarter century or so, it seems that not very much has changed. It seems that sexual abuse is deeply embedded in our culture. Child victims of sexual abuse show some common patterns. In more than 90% of cases, the perpetrator was known to the victim. It wasn't a stranger. In about 20% of the cases, the perpetrator was a family member. More than a quarter of the assaulted children had dropped out of school by the time the assault took place. Well over half the assaults occurred in single parent households. So those factors highlight what especially puts children at risk. Successive studies show high levels of child sexual abuse across Sri Lanka. In a survey of 1300 undergraduates by doctors Aswini Fernando and Vasanta Karna Sekar of the University of Kalania, 58% of men and 34% of women said they had been sexually maltreated as children. Another survey, this time by Dr. Nadika Chandraratna and colleagues of 1500 undergraduates, showed somewhat lower rates of abuse. 11.5% of women said they had been sexually abused as children, compared to 6.5% of men. Remember that the criteria used for abuse in these studies may have been different. Also, the way in which the interviews were conducted may have been different. But regardless of that, a surprising fact that emerges from all these studies is the high number of boys who suffer sexual abuse. This is something that parents often neglect to consider. Of 352 victims of child sexual abuse referred to Jaffna Teaching Hospital, 35% were boys. Now, some of you might think that the victims of rape and sexual abuse may be lying or exaggerating their claims. So, as part of a UN-sponsored study, Professor Nelufa Demel of the University of Colombo and her colleagues looked at the other side of the coin. They interviewed a sample of 1,440 men selected more or less randomly. Their data were analyzed and published by Rachel Jukes and her colleagues as part of a survey of rape across Asia. What they found was astonishing and deeply distressing. 6.2% of Sri Lankan men, 6.2% of Sri Lankan men admitted to having committed rape. 4.6% of these men said they had committed rape on their own, but 1.6% of them said that other men had joined in the rape. In other words, gang rape. Almost 40% of rapists said they had also raped men. Sri Lanka has arguably the highest frequency of the rape of men by men in Asia. This is something we rarely talk about or even see reported in media. Almost 40% of rapists said they had been under 19 years of age when they committed their first rape. More than half the men said they had committed rape more than once. Almost four in five of them said they felt it was their sexual entitlement. Only a third of them admitted to feeling any guilt whatsoever after the rape. So now you see also the dark side of sex in Sri Lanka. Tens of thousands of victims, both women and men, who have been psychologically harmed, traumatized for life. Abusers and rapists know that they almost never get punished. Just 3.2% of men who admitted to having raped someone had ever been arrested. Only 2.1% had ever been sent to prison for their crime. This means that the victims of rape too know that there's little purpose in reporting their crimes. If you report a rape, you are subjected to endless 
ordeals of giving statements to the authorities, of being examined by forensic doctors, spending years attending court proceedings, and then to cap it all being humiliated by the rapist lawyers when you are cross-examined. Many victims just choose to get on with their lives. Who wouldn't? But they never forget what happened to them. They are traumatized for life. The National Child Protection Authority reports that on average, they receive only about one allegation per day of sexual misconduct against a child. Meanwhile, as all these surveys show, thousands upon thousands of children are being subjected to sexual abuse every day. Because it is embarrassing and humiliating, most victims of sexual violence don't report their experience. Would you? A recent study used a method known as a list experiment to find out how serious a problem this phenomenon of underreporting is. Interviews of some 1,800 participants suggested that conflict-related sexual violence had been grossly underreported in Sri Lanka. Only about 10% of victims admitted to sexual violence when directly asked that question. Victims of rape and abuse avoid talking about their experience, even with people sympathetic to their cause. And if you thought rape was bad, wait a moment, it gets worse. Dr. Hélène Touquet of the University of Leuven in Belgium took evidence from 121 men who said they had been subjected to sexual assault while being held in custody in Sri Lanka. They described sexual torture as being central to interrogation by the authorities. They tell horrifying stories of rape, of abuse, of torture that I can't bring myself to describe. I simply don't have the stomach to describe here. There are a lot of studies on institutional rape and sexual abuse by people in uniform in Sri Lanka. That is a separate and distressing topic that frankly, I don't have the courage to discuss openly. However, it is important that we be aware that such people, people capable of such crimes, are part of our society, a part of our state machinery, a part of our military and law enforcement institutions. Finally, I want to deal with the topic of homosexuality. Studies show that across all societies in the world, between 5 and 10% of men and women report that they are homosexual. As the surveys I summarized show, between 20% and 86% of men in Sri Lanka, depending on where you ask the question, say that they have engaged in sex with another male partner. A lot of young boys commonly experiment with homosexual sex. This is not some newfound perversion. We know it's existed across societies for thousands of years. And most of the boys who do this go on to live their lives as heterosexuals. So I want to be clear that the people I refer to in this talk as homosexual are those who form romantic relationships, pair bonds, if you will, with others of their same sex. During the past few decades, many countries have recognized same-sex marriage. The past century has witnessed the disappearance of most forms of prejudice, prejudice against women, prejudice against race, prejudice against caste in Sri Lanka. Our circles of concern are expanding continuously to include rights we previously didn't recognize, the rights of women, the rights of children, the rights of animals, and so on. Prejudice against homosexuals is one of the last prejudices still enforced by law. It's one of the last prejudices still standing. Among South Asian countries, the Supreme Courts of both India and Nepal have legalized homosexual sex between consenting adults. In Sri Lanka, however, Section 365A of the Penal Code criminalizes acts of gross indecency. The meaning of gross indecency may appear vague, but this term has been, for more than a century now, been treated as an euphemism for homosexual sex. It's been interpreted to include, in fact, equated to 
homosexual sex. As recently as 1995, Chandrika Kumarathunga revised the penal code and repealed section 365A, Aha. only to reintroduce it once more with imprisonment of up to two years for anyone engaging in same sex, sex as it were. She must have had her reasons then, but I suspect she regrets that decision now. Even more recently, Ranil Vikramasinghe included acts of gross indecency, even in private, in the draconian emergency regulations he gazetted on the 18th of July this year. It seems there was some kind of homosexual emergency in the country that needed almost terrorist, anti-terrorist legislation to control. But then on the 7th of August, barely three weeks later, Mr. Vikramasinghe inexplicably deleted this odious regulation, despite the fact that it had meanwhile been endorsed with a solid majority in parliament, the Porto majority in parliament. But of course, section 365A remains in force. As recently as 2016, our Supreme Court decided that section 365A of the penal code is still valid. It held that a consensual act of oral sex between two men was in fact a criminal offence and handed down a sentence of two years rigorous imprisonment, albeit suspended. Given how commonplace homosexual practices are according to the studies I've been mentioning in the course of this talk, the law in effect criminalises millions of Sri Lankan men and women. Remember, more than 20% of men said that by the age of 20, they had had sex with another man. By this yardstick, more than a million Sri Lankan men should be behind bars. Parliament makes our laws and 94% of MPs are men. Do the math and you can see why politicians may be reluctant to revise the law and legalize homosexuality as most civilized countries on the planet have done. It might mean having to answer some really awkward questions with the wife and kids around the dinner table. Attitudes of ordinary Sri Lankans to homosexuality are perhaps nowhere better illustrated than by the beach boys who lure tourists for sex along Sri Lanka's southwest coast. A study by Dr. Jody Miller shows that only 18% of beach boys engaged in sex exclusively with women. 78% had sex also with male clients. These young men had their first sexual encounter between the age of 14, when they were still children, and 23. Every one of them said that their introduction to sex had been consensual. They saw nothing morally or ethically wrong with their occupation. Almost none of them perceived themselves, for example, as gay. Beach boys, of course, have sex for money. But what about men who just want to find a same-sex partner? Given that homosexuality is criminalized in Sri Lanka, this makes it a challenge for uh, gay Sri Lankans or lesbian Sri Lankans to find same-sex partners. A survey of 400 young gay and bisexual Sri Lankan men by Dr. Niroshan Jaisekara, using internet chat rooms and personal profiles, revealed some interesting facts. For example, it showed that more than 90% of these 400 men had their sexual debut aged between 11 and 17, when they were legally still children. These studies, all of them done by respected medical and scientific professionals and published in learned peer-reviewed journals, show Sri Lanka struggling to come to terms with sex and sexuality. Statistics dictate that each of us has a sexually abused child, a gay person, a rape victim within our inner circle of family and friends. Yet, so steeped are we in an outdated and hypocritical Victorian morality that we can't bring ourselves to accept it. If we deny what's going on in our society, our children will always risk becoming victims. 
Before I wind this up, I want to have a little rant about just one last thing. Bear with me. It saddens me that young people engaged in romance continue to be treated as criminals, as perverts by the police. It seems that even holding hands in public is now a crime. Even my son, who was walking hand in hand with his wife, was warned by a passing policeman that he faced arrest unless he let go. This is crazy. As long as a half century ago, Sri Lankan tourism ran posters like this. We advertised romance rather than criminalizing it. It seems that we've only gone backwards since then. And come to think of it, it's a good thing that no American president or king of Saudi Arabia has ever visited Sri Lanka, or they might well find themselves behind bars. Frankly, it astonishes me that in a country where 98% of rapists get away with it, all the police can do is go after people in love. To me, these are the beautiful people who are the heroes and the heroines of the novels I read, the rom-coms I watch. Each one of them is a character in a beautiful romance, a love story that is only just beginning. In my opinion, we should make the umbrella lovers of Goldface a mainstream tourist attraction, a selling point for Sri Lankan tourism, just as lovers on the banks of the Seine in Paris are a tourist attraction there. In my opinion, much of the sexual abuse we see in Sri Lanka is because we are just too repressed to talk about sex and deal with it openly. Even parents are too embarrassed to talk about sex with their kids. And the police and the media are only making things worse, not better.